as you, you know, make disciples and pastors and apostles and deacons and deaconess for Jesus. <laughs> praise God. And, praise God. And we, we thank God for you and for what you're doing and the great work at the uh, Living Water Living Water Ministries in Wilmington, Delaware, and keep on keeping on and, and give our greetings to our students there, Shamir and James and Loretta. And we thank God for you. And I'll be talking with you later on in the week, Dr. Jean. Praise God. Okay. Okay, Bryce Baggett, how you doing, Bryce? We greet Bryce Baggett. Anyone else who whose names we didn't call, we want to um, give you credit for being online. Thanks, Bryce. I see that. Anyone Hi, else? Hi, Dr. Carter. This is Loretta Jackson. Loretta Jackson. God bless you, Loretta. Keep up the good God work. God bless you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Cantrell Smith is on. Lisa from Oklahoma. Hi, Lisa. God bless you. Praise God. Praise God. Lisa asks, can I hold up the book again? Yes, this is the book I'm talking about. It's called The Bible in One Year Study Workbook. The Bible in One Year Study Workbook. This is the book that is changing the course of Bible study worldwide. This is the book that they're now using in Jamaica and some other countries. And, and we, we have used this. Uh, Dr. Jean Bratton and Jackie and I have taught from this book um, over a two year period as we've taken people through the Bible in one year in two different year segments. People's lives have been changed and we have some copies left. Uh, this is the book that we would normally be using in this course, but I wrote the current textbook that we're using, uh, Understanding the Bible, to make it comprehensive so that we could do this course in 12 weeks. But the book I'm holding up now, the Bible uh, in one year study workbook, is what we use for the complete week by week, 52 week course. Um, what we're using now in Understanding the Bible is the textbook that I wrote uh, based on the Bible in one year study workbook so that we could complete this assignment in 12 weeks. Incidentally, um, I will send out to each of you tomorrow my website where all of the teachings that Jackie and Dr. Jean Bratton and I have done over the last two years, they are recorded on my WordPress uh, website and so you can go and and tap the archives and get these teachings uh, everything from Genesis to Revelation twice in two, a two-year segment as Dr. Jim Bratton and Jackie and I have taught this course this will help you and strengthen you in your Bible study presentation and even in your own comprehension of the books of the Bible what we cannot get to you through this 12-week course we're taking now, Understanding the Bible, you can pick it up uh, through uh, my videos on my website, and I will send that out to each of you tomorrow. Praise God. All right. Have we gotten all the attendance taken, Jackie? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go. Let's get ready. Uh, hey, um, Jeep says she's so excited. Jeep, with your excitement, would you lead us in prayer tonight? I would love to. Praise God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come together in your name and we worship you and we honor you. It's a joy and a pleasure to come before you and bow and hear what you have to say through Pastor Carter. Father, we just ask that you would anoint Pastor Carter in our ears to receive all that you have for us. We thank you, Father, for, for this time with you and ask that your blessings be upon each and every one. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jeep. Thank you, Jeep. <clears throat> and by the way, before we get started, Jeep, I want you to keep an eye out for a friend of mine. He's a he, lifetime friend. He and I grew up together in Pennsylvania. His name is Jesse Morton. Jesse Morton is currently taking a one wagon wagon train from St. Louis to Colorado Springs. And he's he's got two mules.
that he's has pulling his wagon and Jesse is a, a v Vietnam vet and he is traveling uh, from St. Louis to Denver, Colorado. He's heading for Colorado Springs to bring attention to the uh, affairs and the needs of veterans. So keep an eye out. He's coming in your area. If you get a chance, greet Jesse Morton. He and I grew up together in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's a great undertaking for a man who's 70 years old to drive a two-man wagon, a two-mule wagon train um, from St. Louis. He promised a buddy in a foxhole, Jeep. He promised a buddy in a foxhole in Vietnam that if he outlived him, then he would uh, commemorate him and other veterans by taking the message from coast to coast about the soldiers who fought in Vietnam and the needs of veterans. So a few years ago, Jesse took that mule train from St. Louis to Washington, D.C. Now he's going, he's in uh, uh, clearing, he's, he should be clearing Missouri sometime today on en route to Denver and, and Colorado Springs. And so, uh, and then next year, he'll be going from Denver to the Pacific. So since you're out in Colorado, we hope you'll get a chance to greet him and encourage him. If not, pray for him. Praise God. Okay, that's a commercial for my friend. His name is Jesse Morton. Jesse Morton. And you can find his page on Facebook. Praise God. Thank you, Jeep, for leading us in prayer. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have the very difficult task. Thank you, Jackie, and all of you who are praying for uh, Jesse Morton. We have the task of covering Acts and the Pauline letters. Acts and the Pauline letters in uh, about 50 minutes. Wow. Um, I, I'm telling you right now, we do the best we can. But when you finish this, you'll have a good, you're, you're going to have a good commanding feel for the book of Acts. And I want to give you an overview of the other, the Pauline letters, uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, uh, Philemon and Hebrews. We're adding Hebrews. So where your textbook says nine letters, we're looking at not ten letters. Hebrews. We're giving credit to Paul as the writer of Hebrews. The book of Acts, ladies and gentlemen, it ought to be uh, more attributed to the Holy Spirit. In fact, in some Bibles, the book is entitled The Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Lives of of the apostles the acts of the holy spirit in the lives of the holy spirit in the lives of the acts of the holy spirit in the lives of the apostles this book is awesome we see the holy spirit moving in the lives of these apostles and the key is ladies and gentlemen the key is the key is that they waited in jerusalem as jesus told them they waited for the promise. Now, I want to, I want to encourage you. Uh, uh, I want to encourage each of you. God has ministry for all of you, and, and many of you are operating in ministry already. Um, I've seen people over the years run and do well, but burn themselves out. Many uh, get confused. Many get blindsided by Satan. But I want to encourage you. Seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, if you've already been baptized with the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you every day because you cannot be successful in serving the Lord without the Holy Spirit. I've seen so many people lose their, their calling, lose their anointing, lose their positions because they they deny the Holy Spirit, they grieve the Holy Spirit, and they try to do things on their own. And so I'm one, I, I, I teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every Sunday for the last three weeks on Sunday mornings, we've been teaching about being filled with the Holy Spirit and what the blessings are. And the Lord wants us to have the power, the power. God has called some of you to great ministries. 
and you need the power, you need the guidance, you need the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the strength, so that he can come alongside of you and guide you into all truth. Ladies and gentlemen, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, I'm teaching on Sundays, last Sunday and, and next Sunday, teaching about uh, what happens after you're filled with the Holy Spirit, so that people can know the comfort and the joy of being led by the Spirit, so that you're not out there on a limb by yourself. You're not out there uh, all, all by yourself, but God wants you to work with him, and he will work with you. And Jesus gave us the example in Scripture. He told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem. Jesus was saying, I know you're anxious to go into the whole world. Timothy, I know you're anxious to go to India. Matthew, I know you're anxious to meet the Ethiopian. And I know you're anxious to do this, but get the power. Get the power. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you, seek God. Receive the baptism. And if I can help you, give me a call. I'll, I'll surely be glad to talk to you and, and share with you uh, what the Lord has revealed to me. And just just encourage you uh, through prayer and um, um, what God is doing. Okay, so in looking at the book of Acts, we're looking at God using many people but the, the book is divided into two, two parts. Uh, chapters 1 through 12 is all about uh, the main character is Peter, Simon Peter. From uh, chapter 13 on through uh, the end of the book, the main character is the Apostle Paul. And so uh, uh, chapter 12 it ends with Peter um, 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 being in prison, and Peter was later... Um, the, the 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 break is that Peter is imprisoned, and so uh, he eventually is martyred in in Rome. And then the book of Acts ends with Paul uh, being in prison. We don't see his martyrdom. We don't see him being put to death. But Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and Luke is writing this as a companion to the Gospel of Luke. We see Luke writing to a man named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus has a couple of interpretations. Number one, the name may be uh, uh, Luke's sponsor, the one who sponsored his writing, a real person by the name of Theophilus. Or he could have been a high-ranking official who's going under a, a pseudonym, a false name, because he wants to conceal his identity. In those days, to identify fight yourself as a Christian meant certain death in certain areas. But then there's another interpretation that the name Theophilus means, if you break it down into its Greek um, prefix and suffix, Theophilus uh, is lover of God, lover of God. Theophilus may have been Luke's pen name, pseudonym for the church, the lover of God, the church, the body of Christ. And so we see Luke writing this between 60 and 62 A.D. The experts have kind of nailed this date down because uh, the book ends before the death of Paul. So we don't know anything about Paul's death. Uh, we have little information about his being set free from prison and then, then being rearrested. So Luke ends at a time um, when, when, uh, when, when Paul is uh, in Rome. And later on, we find he do, he goes to prison and he is martyred. His Paul's Paul's uh, head was chopped off. Nero, Emperor Nero, cut off. Had the axe man cut off Paul's head uh, in his his angry uh, uh, retaliation against the church. We know Nero came straight out of pit out of the pit of hell, and he did his best to kill and destroy the church. He put Peter to death. Peter was crucified upside down, and Paul was beheaded. But the things that accomplished, they accomplished in their lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess it really doesn't matter which way we leave this world, but we're going to leave in a blaze of glory because we've got the greater one in us. Greater is he in us than he that's in the world. Uh, we pray that all of us will have a long life and a peaceful life. But whichever way we leave here, as long as we hold on to Jesus Christ, 
Uh, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be at home from the Lord. And uh, when I read um, the book of Acts and I get near the end, I start tearing up. I get tearing up. And when I read 2 Timothy, ladies and gentlemen, 2 Timothy, you're talking about a grown man crying. When I read where Paul says, I've, I've, I've fought a good fight. I, I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Man, you talk about a big baby getting ready to cry. That's me because Paul is one of my favorite characters. And uh, with scripture, I like to get in on the page. I want to be right there with the main character. I want to learn and see what they went through. So as you look at the book of Acts, it is exciting. We learn so much during uh, this book through this book the book of acts records the spread of christianity from jerusalem to rome it is also a sequel to the life of jesus christ that was recorded in the gospels acts is the initiation of jesus great commission to take the gospel to all the nations and so the central truth in this book is jesus has given us power to witness everywhere Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has given us power to witness everywhere. And when he told his disciples, ye shall be uh, disciples for me uh, into going to Jerusalem and uh, Samaria and to uh, Judea, all the uttermost parts of the world. He not only spoke to his disciples, but he spoke to us that we're, that we're to take this gospel. I was watching TBN the other day and looking at TBN Network now has uh, uh, programs being aired in Arabic countries, and God has uh, pastors in Arabic countries who are airing uh, TBN. So the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, God loves the world so much that the gospel is going into all the world. And you're part of this army. You're part of this end time army. My prayer for the Paul Begley School of Prophet, Prophecy is this. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, raise up an army of prophets. Raise up an army of prophets. Whether or not you're called to the office of prophecy, uh, just uh, raise up an army. Men, women, boys and girls, old and young, who will hear from God and speak what God gives to them. And this uh, end time ministry is so important. Praise God. And so... Uh, when we look at the book of Acts, we look at on page 226, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. And through the spirit baptism, believers were baptized into the body of Christ. I don't have much time to describe the baptisms that we receive. We receive a baptism into the body of Christ. And then uh, we can receive the Holy Spirit baptism. When we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. Nothing can remove us from the body of Christ. That is a baptism. Now, your baptism by water, your water baptism, is a demonstration. You're making a statement to the world that you, you have given your heart to Jesus Christ and that you are identifying with his death. That's when you go under the water and you identify with his resurrection. Baptism is a statement, ladies and gentlemen. Baptism does not save anyone. It's a statement in obedience to Christ that we now identify. In other words, you lay down your life. The, the moment you accept Christ, you die. You die to self. And you identify with the with the the, uh, the crucified Savior, and then you identify with His burial, and then when um, you come up out of the water, you you're identifying with the resurrected Jesus. And we get a good picture of this from um, from the book of Romans, chapter six, that as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so must we walk in newness of life. So read Romans chapter 6 to get a good view of baptism. And then there's the Holy Spirit baptism. 
the baptism that so many in the church want to run away from and so many have misrepresented and Satan has taken the Holy Ghost baptism and he has messed up many people in the church by erroneous teachings and using false prophets and using ignorant pastors to try to teach people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the fact that we have a church, the body of Christ, where most of the people in the church don't believe they need the baptism. And many pastors don't want teachings on the baptism. They'd rather teach about this and that and that and this. But ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, wait on the power. The Bible says, be filled with with the Holy Ghost. Do not be drunk with wine. And, and the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, we do the Lord a disservice if we're walking in ignorance and we're grieving the Holy Spirit, we're denying him access to our lives. You see, the scripture says in um, the scripture says in Galatians 2:20, we were crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live. Yet not we, but Christ lives in us. And the life that we live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ died for us. And when we accept him, we die. We die. We die. But the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is what has resurrected us into the newness of life. That's how we got born again. And so why not let the very one who gave us the new birth fill us with his spirit so that we can live this new life that we're talking about? Praise God. The uh, Korean pastor Paul Yonggi Cho, who had a church of millions of people, Paul Yonggi Cho, they would meet in caves and all over Korea. Paul Yonggi Cho said this, uh, the American church has a lot of talky talky but not a lot of walkie walkie so <laughs> ladies and gentlemen let's 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 be let's walkie walkie let's walk in the spirit let's be filled with the spirit ask god to fill you with the holy spirit get some teachings some teachings about the holy spirit baptism and 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 receive the gift ladies and gentlemen i'll tell i'll tell you once you get the gift if you get the gift of tongues now tongues is not the baptism tongues is just one aspect of the holy spirit baptism ladies and gentlemen the gift of prophecy you can lay hands on the sick you go in the hospital and lay hands on the sick and people recover uh you get the the, the anointing to help govern the church to govern people uh, the gift of helps ladies and gentlemen they are spirit filled people they don't speak in tongues but they can sure enough walk into your house and get you healed if you're sick ladies and gentlemen so let's stop grieving the holy spirit and and walking in ignorance and and denying the holy spirit that which he purposes to do jesus wants us filled and ladies and gentlemen i'll be the first one to repent repent i repent for walking in pride saying i got this i can handle this so many pastors are saying i got this i can handle this well pastor carter said i don't have this i can't handle it i need help holy spirit help me and every day i'm praying for a new filling every day the what we're doing, what Jackie and I are doing, what Pastor Paul and Sister Heidi are doing, and what you're doing. You're not doing this on your own. It is not some special gift or charisma you have. We do this by Christ in us, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit. And we give him all the praise and the glory. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. It's about praise and glory. When Peter stood up and preached after the day of, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got uh, saved, and they were amazed that people speaking in unknown languages all over Jerusalem, and later on, uh, people receiving the gift of tongues and, and being able to speak in languages that they didn't know, but they... I've seen missionaries go to Africa speaking in tongues and, and not knowing what they were saying, speaking in an unknown language by faith, and people running to the altar uh, saying, you're speaking our language, you're speaking my dialect, that's my native tongue. Ladies and gentlemen, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the power that 
God has made available to the, the church to get the job accomplished. So don't try to do it all by yourself. Don't try to be like the Lone Ranger. That music sounds good, but we can't do this on our own. We need help. We need help. So praise God. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this, page 227. The Holy Spirit chose a new temple to dwell in. This new temple was the body of every believer. And in the paragraphs above this, we talk about how the, the uh, cloud covered the tabernacle and God would come into the tabernacle and dwell. And that later, when Solomon built the temple, the glory cloud would cover the temple and God would meet the people at the mercy seat. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now there is no uh, tabernacle. There is no temple. Ladies and gentlemen, God's glory cloud wants to come up. Come on. Oh, glory to God. God's glory cloud wants to come upon you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says, know ye not, ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost, whose you are. Ladies and gentlemen, do not deny Jesus Christ the opportunity to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Do not deny uh, the world the opportunity to get saved through your ministry when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, you may say, but I don't, I can't see myself doing this. I don't know how I'm going to get the job done. Well, you can't get it done. You cannot get it done. But when you partner, hallelujah, with the Holy Spirit and get filled and commit everything to him and walk in obedience with him and walk in humility, do justice, love mercy, and let the Spirit of God arise in you, it does not yet appear what the church shall be. It does not yet appear. Eyes have not seen nor have ears heard what the Lord has in store for them that love him. So praise God. That's a Holy Ghost commercial, ladies and gentlemen, a commercial for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism. And so the Holy Spirit is looking for new temples to dwell in. He dwells in every believer. Every believer, ladies and gentlemen, has the Holy Spirit. Now, just as you see on your screen, Paul Begley lifting up his cup to take a sip of coffee and getting ready to say, are you serious? Well, this cup has some coffee in it, okay? Uh, in your temple, in your body, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. And I'm sure that when Pastor... Pastor's cup is empty. He asks Sister Heidi, fill my cup. Or he'll pour some coffee in his cup. Fill it. Fill it. And ladies and gentlemen, as 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 you drink it, as you as you go about ministry and, and you lose your power, uh, get filled again. Every day we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, can you prove that to me, Pastor, by Scripture? Yes. When you look at chapter 2 of Acts, chapter 3 of Acts, and looking at other... Uh, uh, chapters in, the, in in Acts, you'll see the, the disciples, the apostles going up to people and, and they're being persecuted, they're arrested, they're beaten, and then they uh, Peter and James were miracul miraculously uh, uh, delivered from prison and uh, the church, when they began rejoicing, God filled them again. Every time the apostles were beaten down, God would fill them with more power. That's the work of of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will do the same in your life. Well, praise God. I didn't intend to teach this book tonight this way, but that's the way we went, okay? And so we see in, in the book of Acts, uh, the first 12 chapters, your principal personality is Peter. After that, for the rest of the book, the principal personality is Paul, Saul of Tarsus. A man who hated the church. He persecuted the church. He put folks in prison. Many of them that he put in prison were executed. They died. But God can use a thug. God can change anybody who's willing. And God met Paul on the, on the road to Damascus. The Lord met him uh, in Acts chapter 9. 
and changed his life. But before that, we see the gospel going into Africa, ladies and gentlemen. The gospel went into Africa by way of the Ethiopian eunuch. Praise God. Acts chapter 8, where Philip met the Ethiopian. The Holy Spirit told Philip, I want you to leave this ministry and go towards Gaza. So there are times when God may redirect your ministry, ladies and gentlemen. So people will criticize you. They have their advice and their counsel, but obey the Holy Spirit. Walk in obedience. God told, uh, the Holy Spirit told Philip, leave Samaria and go uh, towards Gaza. And Philip obeyed and saw a, an Ethiopian. The Ethiopian means burnt skin, black, dark skin. He was a black man from Ethiopia. He was a treasure of the nation of Ethiopia. And this man was sitting in his chariot reading uh, from the scroll of Isaiah. You'll say, well, what's he doing? What was a black dude doing sitting in the, in the desert in a chariot reading Isaiah? Well, he was a proselyte. He was one whom the Jews had converted to Judaism out of Ethiopia, and he came to the Passover every year to celebrate the Passover. He just happened to be in Jerusalem at the time they crucified Christ. And Philip met this man on the road, and the man was sitting in his chariot going back to Ethiopia. And um, Philip walked up to him and said, do you understand what you're reading? The man said, no, I need someone to teach me. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got people all over this nation and all over the world who need someone to teach them about the contents of the Bible. And, and, and many of us are called to help in that area. And when Philip uh, preached to the man, uh, the man received Jesus. And then he said, I want to be baptized, but there's no water in this desert. And God miraculously uh, created water so that the, the man could be water baptized. Next thing we know, according to the scripture, Philip was caught up in the air by the Holy Spirit and he flew to a place called Azotus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there were no Ethiopian airlines or no uh, 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 El Al or no uh, uh, Jerusalem airlines. There were no planes, but the Holy Ghost picked him up and flew him to a place called Azotus. Next thing we know about Philip uh, is about five. He had five daughters, five daughters. They don't mention his wife in the scripture, but Philip had five da daughters and they were all prophets. Ladies and gentlemen, that we should give a kudos shout out to women in the scripture, women in the scripture. Ladies and gentlemen, God uses women mightily. Hallelujah. And he still does. Philip Philip's five daughters were prophets. Hallelujah. So then we see Paul. Paul gets converted, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about converted. He didn't join, ladies and gentlemen. Nowhere in the ninth chapter of, of Acts do we see Paul joining the church. Nowhere in the book of Acts do we see these apostles asking people to join the church. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a nation of people who have joined the church as though the church is a club. They give them a box of offering envelopes. They give them a, a website now where you can pay your dues by PayPal or online. But ladies and gentlemen, this church that we preach about in the Bible, you cannot join it. You must be birthed into it. You must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you are born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've, we've got to under, underline uh, and, and, and cancel out a lot of the negative teaching in this nation and the nations that people believe that if they attend a church or if they go to where uh, uh, this prophet is or if they attend the services uh, by this big name preacher, or they attend this mega church, that they are Christians. People easily lay, label themselves in this country as Christians. But ladies and gentlemen, to be a Christian, you must surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You are born into the kingdom of God. You must be bo born. So uh, the, the, 
The way in which you're born into the kingdom of God is to confess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that you believe he died on the cross, he was buried, rose again from the dead, and ask him to come into your life. And upon that confession, people are birthed into the kingdom of God. You cannot join the church. You must be born into it. And we must tell people, we must tell people, we must tell people. And ladies and gentlemen, in our telling, there are people we've got to offend because there are some hard-headed, stiff-necked people in this nation and in the nations. They are so stuck. I mean, I've been run out of churches. I've been asked not to come back to preach because they don't like the way I preach. They, I've had pastors tell me, Pastor Carter, you can come back and preach, but don't bring that Holy Ghost mess. So, so they were signing their own death warrants. They were signing their people, assigning them to being sick and maimed and and paralyzed uh god god uses some of us and we can go into churches lay hands on people and the holy ghost heals them ladies and gentlemen i would i would welcome that kind of ministry if god would send a prophet uh uh to 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 my fellowship and all the people who have cancer get healed of cancer all the people who are crippled get healed of what's crippling them amen and give the praise and glory and honor to god but ladies and gentlemen i've had pastors tell me pastor carter you're welcome to come and preach but don't bring that holy ghost mess and another thing they say, you're welcome to come and preach and bring your choir with you. Uh, they just want the choir because they want the money. They want the offering. They don't want the, the, the spirituality. They don't want to honor God. They don't want to see God move. And so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, since they don't want to hear us in some of the churches, some of the fellowships won't welcome me and won't welcome Pastor Paul and don't want us there, then we do what God says. Philip, listen to the voice of the listen. This is going to bless somebody. Philip listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And Philip was involved in a great ministry in Samaria. And the Holy Spirit said, leave this ministry and go to Gaza. And when the Lord, when the Lord said for me to, to leave the, the church and develop the online church, I obeyed him. People ridicule me. They laugh. Uh, that's not a church. How many members you got, Pastor Carter? Hey, I don't have any members. I don't own anybody. Uh, T.D. Jakes doesn't have any members. Joel Osteen doesn't have any members. John Hagee doesn't have any members. People attend the church where they lead, but we don't own anybody. We don't have any members. God told me not to count heads, but to get online and open the online church. And this church is reaching people worldwide, ladies and gentlemen, reaching people. And this this ministry, uh, this the Bible in one year study program has reached thousands of people all over the globe. They are watching our YouTube videos and our videos from our, our website. And I'm saying ours, but it's these are programs developed by the Lord. And we give the Lord the praise. We give God all the praise ladies and gentlemen do not try don't attempt to touch his glory don't take any credit for anything give the credit to the lord god said no flesh will touch his glory and so we see as the the apostles went through doing what they did we see death many of them had to face death they confronted death we talked last week about john uh the apostle john they tried to boil him in oil but he wouldn't cook and uh we see many of the uh, the apostles facing and confronting death thomas was killed in india and matthew was killed in ethiopia and peter uh met an, uh, a horrible death and 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 <clears throat> they say all that the experts say that all of the apostles suffered a horrible death except for john I had to get a little bit of water, clear the pipes. John lived to be 120 years old, and he died a natural death. <clears throat> okay, so let's flip through Romans. Romans, we won't do a whole lot with these books, but Romans is considered uh, the gospel of the New Testament. Romans is a very powerful book written to the believers in Rome, Paul had many friends in Rome. Many of his friends 
ended up in Rome. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, fellow tent makers with Paul. Uh, we look at, there was a woman, uh, an Ethiopian woman uh, a, 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 from Cyrene. She was the wife of Simon of Cyrene. Simon is the one who carried Jesus' cross. Uh, he was an African. His wife wound up in Rome along with her sons, Alexander and Rufus. Paul greets them in the 16th chapter of Romans. And Paul has a whole list of people uh, whom he met in his journeys. And they all end up in Rome <clears throat> together. So this book of, uh, to the Romans is very, very important because it outlines what the gospel is all about and what the Lord expects the church to do. Praise God. And so this, this epistle talks about justification by faith. In other words, we're saved by faith. For we're saved by faith. We're justified by faith, not by works. God does not want you working yourself to death, trying to please him. You cannot please him. Works will not do it. James said, uh, your faith is not, no good unless you have some works with us. So James said, if you say you have faith, we ought to see it through your works. And then Paul says, uh, works is not going to get it all. They did not conflict. Uh, Paul is saying, you're justified by faith. He took, took off from where Habakkuk and Hosea left off, where a man is justified by faith in God. Praise God. Uh, by having good standing with God. <clears throat> So the central message in Romans is the righteousness of God in the gospel of Christ. The next book is the book of 1 Corinthians. When we look at 1 and 2 Corinthians together, we see that Paul um, started this church on one of his missionaries journeys. And then he uh, wrote to them because of a certain situation where they were, well, let's put it this way. The wrong, the Corinthians were corrupt. I mean, they claimed they loved the Lord, but, but they, they were, they were sex freaks. They had orgies. Uh, uh, Corinth was the sex sin capital of the world. And the worldliness in the world infiltrated the church. Leaders of the church were involved in sexual immorality. And Paul had to write because one man in the church was having sex with his mother-in-law. Ladies and gentlemen, he was having sex with his mother-in-law. And Paul reprimanded them and said, take care of this situation. Put him out of the church until he repents. You have a responsibility to do something about this. And ladies and gentlemen, when we take, Jackie and I were talking about this today all the stuff that's going on in the church and and people uh accuse you when you start meddling into stuff that people are involved in in the church they think you're judging them but ladies and gentlemen god has guidelines he's got guidelines for pastors and preachers and apostles and and bishops uh when you read first timothy chapter three you see his standards God has guidelines for church officers. We see in Acts chapter 6 where the church had need of deacons and, and leaders. And the and, uh, Holy Spirit said, search among you. Uh, find seven men of good report. Uh, men who, are, who have one wife, who, who are, are, are not uh, 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 alcoholics, not greedy for money or filthy lucre. So God has his standards. And the church has to go by the standards of the scriptures. But in the Corinthian church, ladies and gentlemen, it was do whatever you want, to whom and with whom, and yet they call themselves Christians. So Paul had the right thing, right to them and tell them, get things in order. And Paul said, if you don't set things in order, I'm coming. Now Paul said, you don't like my appearance. Some of you say, I don't look like I'm an apostle. And, and you think my letters are strong, but he said, I would rather you correct this situation now than to have me come and correct it. So First um, and Second Corinthians are all about <clears throat> church order. And um, we learn so much in, in these books. And in, ladies and gentlemen, we were talking a few minutes ago about 
the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, if we would read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 and study those chapters, there will be less violation of the gifts of the Spirit and there will be a greater understanding and a greater appreciation for the Holy Ghost baptism. But a lot of preachers don't want to read this and they don't want to teach it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way that the church is to operate. And that's the Lord's way as he's specified <clears throat> in scripture. So in uh, 1 Corinthians, we also learn that we're involved in spiritual warfare. Uh, those of you who have a copy of my book, The Giants Are Back, learn how spiritual warfare is coming against us like never before. And the giants are back, but we get a word from the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 to 5, verses 3 to 5. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. God gives us a method to do warfare and to be successful without going into the flesh. We don't need to uh, cock our guns or load our guns and, and, and load our glocks and our assault weapons uh, the scriptures give us we have spiritual weapons that are more powerful than any weapon uh, the scripture says greater is he in you than he that's in the world and so Paul adds to that when he wrote to the Ephesians about putting on the full armor of God and then uh, using the weapons uh, that the uh, full armor brings along with it okay Galatians <clears throat> the book of Galatians, one standout um, verse in this book of Galatians is chapter 3, verse 1, where Paul says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, Paul, Paul founded that church on his first missionary journey. And uh, he went through Galatia. And preach the gospel. Many churches were organized under the leadership of Paul and Barnabas. And then just a few years later, because the Judaizers followed Paul, and Paul's critics followed him everywhere he went, and they unpreached what Paul preached to the point where the Galatians, who had so readily accepted Jesus Christ by faith, had now added worldliness and added their own uh, conditions to salvation. And so Paul had to write to the Galatians, and he reprimanded them. He said, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he's saying, you accept the Jesus by faith, but now you're adding works and adding all other principles on top of salvation, and on top of what uh, you've learned, so that you're, you're, making, you're making slaves of the people with your encumbrances that you're adding to their lives uh, in order for them to be Christians. So Paul set the record straight, and he talked about uh, a salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and that people don't have to go through changes and jumping through loops to be labeled a Christian. And in many of our churches, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who will be listening to this tape in, 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 in uh, other countries, uh, you don't have to take people through. People should not have, should not have to jump through loops to prove that they are Christians. It's by faith in the complete work of Jesus Christ on the, on, on the cross. Then after Galatians is Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians, a great book, a great book. It's all about church order, how to order the church, that the church ought to be an orderly organism. And um, the in Ephesians, the mystery of the church is unveiled. God hid the church from Satan. Satan had no clue that there would be a church. And he hid that even from the prophets. And so now that Satan knows that the church is powerful, he's doing everything he can to destroy the integrity of the church. But we are going to stand on the word of God and proclaim the word of God and trust the Lord. Amen. And be faithful to him. So, um, Ephesians um, teaches a lot about the doctrine of the church and strengthens every believer. Philippians, uh, we're going to just brush through this. 
the central theme is for me to die is Christ. For me to live is Christ, is, is Christ. Let me correct that. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. Paul, Paul knew he was facing the death sentence. He wrote this letter from a Roman prison. He knew that he had a meeting at some time in the future with the axe man the cho on the chopping block. But Paul said to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, hey, I'm in a win-win situation. <clears throat> if I live, I continue to promote Jesus Christ. If I die, if I get killed, they execute me. Uh, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And praise God, what a, what a, what a way to look at, look at this new life in Christ. Uh, if we live as we live, we can continue to proclaim Jesus Christ so that others can get this life. And if we die, then uh, the moment we die, boom, we're in glory. We're walking down the celestial streets of heaven. Praise God. Praise God. So uh, after Philippians, we're looking at Colossians. And the main thing about the book of Colossians is that Jesus Christ has preeminence over everything. There is no God above him. There is nobody who can replace him. Jesus Christ is Lord. He died on the cross. He was buried in the grave. He rose again from the dead. And he sits on the right hand of the throne of God. And he's coming back soon. And everything we do, say, or think ought to be focused on Jesus Christ, whom God sent because he loved the world so much. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not make idols out of people. Don't allow anyone to be an idol in your life or don't let anything anything be an idol in your life. Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Let us keep our focus on him. Then we look at 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, 1st Thess Thessalonians. Fah, we got to kind of spit that out. Fah. Put that tongue under your upper teeth and, and blow it out. Thessalonians. First, I, I remember years ago hearing people say Thessalonians with an F. It is not Thessalonians. It's Thessalonians. Well, let me move on. First Thessalonians is all about Paul responding to a question that the people of, of Thessalonica had. They were concerned because the Lord was delaying his second coming. And they were saying, well, what is going to happen uh, if Jesus tarries? What's going to happen to those who died ahead of us who love the Lord? And so Paul attends to that question about the dead in Christ. And in that fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, we see uh, the great teaching that uh, when, uh, when the trumpet sounds, Jesus shall stand in the clouds with a shout. Amen. He's going to make some noise, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to stand in the cloud. He's going to shout. He might say, church, come home. And, and the scripture says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Praise God. They're going to rise first. All who died in Christ. Not everybody who, listen to me now, not everybody who died as a church goer, because every church goer ain't going to get saved. Now, that's not judgmental. That's preaching the gospel. You must be born again. You might go to church, but if you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ and received him as Savior, please do so now so that you get the guarantee of your life insurance policy that you'll live again. But the dead in Christ shall rise. And then the scripture says, and those of us who remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds. So, the believers who are alive at the time Jesus cracks the clouds, the scripture says, after the dead in Christ rise up, and as they rise, they're rising in their resurrected bodies, ladies and gentlemen, from the place of their burial or their demise. They're rising in their resurrected, glorified body, the body Christ prepares for them to be able to uh, uh, endure eternity and love eternity eternally in heaven and then the bible says those of us who are alive we'll be caught up with them 
in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to, uh, if Jesus comes while we're still alive, we're going to transition in midair. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be translated like Enoch and like Elijah. We'll be translated. We will go, boom, from this physical body, boom, to a spiritual body. Oh, and, and it'll be a real live body, but it will be a body that can live eternally in the presence of the Lord. Oh, mm, mm. I could preach on this, but I'm not going to. See, this body we're living in right now, we, this body can't stand all the glory of heaven. This body, this shell that I'm living in cannot stand the glory of heaven. The light of heaven, the glory of heaven will blow this, this body to smithereens. But God has a new body. I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that good news? Ain't that good news? I got a home up in that kingdom. Ain't that news? Ain't that good news? I got a house. Uh eternal in the heavens not made by hand glory to god and so do you amen that's good news that's good news amen and god has a a a mansion a body a home prepared for each of us an eternal glorious body no more mm, no more sickness no more acne no more tooth decay no more crippling no more cancer no more this no i mean it's going to be an eternal body a glorious body amen uh that we're 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 just fellowship and worship god and honor god and 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 our bodies will be the temples of god to glorify god in heaven mm, mm, mm. man oh man you're talking about something good you're talking about something good well uh just a couple more books in um the New Testament, we're running out of time. Oh man, first and second Timothy. I need a whole hour to talk about Timothy. Uh, Paul's friend, Paul's trusted friend in the ministry. Just a young guy. He reminds me so much of uh, Matt Borland. I know I let, let, put Matt out there quite often, and I don't want to set you up, Matt, but uh, Matt Borland, to me, Matt Borland, uh, man, if I could choose, if I could just choose somebody to, to be my apprentice. But I'm not gonna do that, Matt. Uh, I just, I just love you, Matt. I love your spirit. I love your, your, your love for the Lord and your cooperation. You, Matt, may say, oh, "Man, he don't know me that well. I'm all messed up." Man, Matt, you don't know me that well, man. You don't know where I came from. But I know God took me and made something beautiful out of my life, and He's doing the same for you. But I love you, Matt, because you're teachable. Now, I don't usually sound off on a particular individual like this because uh, there's so many of you others who, uh, like Bryce Baggett, man, Bryce, Bryce Baggett, man, God's got a great calling on you. But I, and I love you all. I pray for you so much, all of you, because God's got a great work for you. Amen. Well, Paul loved Timothy the same way. And uh, Paul encouraged that young man. And then, uh, in that uh, second chapter, uh, in, in the book of Second Timothy, Paul lets Timothy know, hey, Timothy, all this training, I gave you a crash course. I gave you a crash course in, in all I know about Jesus. And uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to be executed, man. And he writes to Timothy and says, come before winter. And Paul is saying, hey, brother, if you don't get there before winter, it's like if Matt says, hey, Pastor, come to Erie, Pennsylvania, but come before October. Or if you don't get there by October, you probably have to wait till May or June. I know what you're saying, Matt. Okay, <laughs> 200, 200 inches of snow, he says. But Paul is saying to Timothy, come before winter. There be no ships coming to Rome in the winter. And, and I know, Paul is saying, I know I won't be here next spring. I know I won't be here when the flowers pop up again. So please, Timothy, come and see me. Bring my cloak, bring my coat, bring my books, bring my parchments. I, I need to, to write some more letters. Bring my books. And, 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 and then, oh, man, this just touches my heart, ladies and gentlemen. When he says, and bring John Mark with you, ladies and gentlemen. That just lets me know about the reconciling love of Jesus Christ and the fact that everybody in the church, we ought to be able to get along, ought to be no grudges, no, no hostility, no bitterness, no resentment. Mark left the first missionary journey. He left Paul and Barnabas holding the bag. 
and and Paul was angry with him for a long time, but Paul forgave him. And then uh, as Mark realized he had done wrong and Mark grew and you know every one of us has to grow ladies and gentlemen we must mature that's why we need the Holy Ghost Mark matured and Paul said in his closing letter to uh, Timothy he says and bring Mark with you he's profitable see before that Paul considered John Mark not to be profitable He's not, not a prophet. He's not profitable to this ministry. He left us. He left us. And we can't depend on him. But now Paul said, hey, man, bring this young man with you. I need to see him too. And ladies and gentlemen, whew, teaching this gospel and teaching you all is such a blessing. And I thank God for this calling. Gene Bratton, you know what I'm talking about. I thank God that he's chosen us to teach you. And we're just passing the torch to a new generation. And what we're teaching you, you're going to teach others. You're going to roll this thing over to others. And the Lord has a way that the church is going to perpetuate itself by the Holy Spirit. And you do what you're called to do. And you do what you're called to do. And when it's all over, we'll meet in glory and have a good time. Praise Amen. God. Praise God. Then we go to the Amen. Philemon. Uh, Philemon, is that in our list? Philemon, it's all about forgiving um, someone who did you wrong. Onesimus was the slave of Philemon. Yes, Christians had slaves in those days. Understand the culture. And uh, Paul did not promote slavery. But Paul said to Onesimus, go back. Onesimus came to Rome and met Paul. And Paul converted him and told him, now go back to your master and humble yourself and repay him what you stole from him. And Paul gave him, you know, a lot of, I, I know a lot of, a lot of black people, they hate this book of Philemon. I don't hate it because I know slavery had its, its place in this nation. We would not be a great nation today if we had not dealt with slavery and if we've not learned how to overcome our differences through the love of Jesus Christ. So I do not negate our history, but I look at Paul looking at Onesimus and saying, you're a runaway slave. I cannot condone your running away. I cannot condone the fact that you stole money from your master. And now that you're a born again believer, I want you to go back to your master. Humble yourself. Tell him I've wronged you and work off what you owe him. Now, Paul did not condone slavery. But Paul met the man in his condition and said, you owe Philemon what you stole from him, and you're still under contract with him. So go back and work it out. And then he wrote to Philemon, and, and in the same letter, he writes to Philemon and says, now, I want you to look at Onesimus as a different person. Yes, he stole from you. He did you wrong. Yes, he's your slave. but I want you to consider him from this point on, not as a slave, but as a Christian brother. There's a big difference, ladies and gentlemen. And when we begin in this nation and in the nations, looking at one another as brothers and sisters, regardless of race, color, appearance, uh, geographical location, uh, uh, ethnicity, when we look at one another as brothers and sisters made in the image of God, that's what Paul was telling Philemon to do with Onesimus. What a great and marvelous church this would be. And so Paul ended that letter to Philemon saying, and if Onesimus owes you anything, charge it to my account. Okay, uh, hit me up on my PayPal account. Just deduct whatever he owes you. I mean, Paul was cool. Paul, because Paul had favor with Onesimus. And Paul had favor with Philemon. If he owes you anything, 
You charge it to my account. account. I'll pay it off. Now, Paul's writing this from prison. He's about to die. But he says, even though I'm about to die, I'll pay off what this brother owes you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, an exciting book. And Hebrews, uh, Titus, Hebrews, we don't have time for Hebrews. Um, we have to get to that. Titus and Hebrews. Uh, Titus is the man that Paul placed in uh, the leadership of the church on the Isle of Crete. That's where Barnabas was from, the Isle of Crete. And uh, Titus became the pastor there. Paul gave him instructions. Ladies and gentlemen, pastors ought to read the book of Titus to get the what the qualifications for a leader is all, are all about and, and, and uh, what God requires. And then um, Hebrews, I, I think I did Titus and Philemon out of place, but Hebrews is all about a letter, we believe written by Paul, to the Jewish Christians, the Hebrew Christians who are scattered all over the world. This letter was to be read to them because the persecution that hit not only the Christians, but hit the Jews in the 60s A.D., and we see this in the year 70 A.D., Jerusalem fell, and Jews were persecuted all over the world, so much so that from 70 A.D. until 1948, the Jews had no homeland. Everywhere in the world, they were killed, slaughtered, and put to death. And so Paul writes to the Jews who had left the sanctuary of Judaism to follow Jesus Christ, knowing that they would be persecuted and were being persecuted. Paul writes to them and says, I know you're being persecuted, and I know there's such pressure on you, even by your own Jewish people who hate you because you embrace Christ Jesus. But do not turn back. Do not go back to Judaism. He says, Judaism is dead. This is a new covenant. And so Paul encouraged the Hebrew Christians to stay in the faith and not turn back. Ladies and gentlemen, the persecution was so hard on some of them, many of them, that they wanted to turn back and at least live peacefully in their own Jewish communities. But ladies and gentlemen, the scripture says that if any man is in Christ, he must suffer persecution. You and I will have to suffer persecution. But we can persevere with the love of Jesus Christ. I know I went a little longer tonight, but we had a lot of ground to cover. And um, I praise God and thank God. Praise God. We're going to turn this back over to Sister Jackie for any closing comments and closing prayer. I thank God for this blessing. Oh, what a blessing it was to teach tonight. Praise God. Thank you, everybody. And um, it was an awesome lesson, an awesome lesson. And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit takes over. Even the ordinary becomes extraordinary. And I just want to encourage each of you. It's so good to see your comments and your support of each other. Um, thank you, Sharon. We will keep Tammy and her husband in our prayers, as well as each and every one of you. Um, one of the things that I learned as a teacher in the classroom is that if I really tuned in to my students, they taught me as much and maybe even more sometimes than I taught them. And that is what we are experiencing with this ministry, um, the Paul Begley School of, of Ministry, that as we helped, as we help you, as we assist you, and as pastor teaches you, we are in turn learning so much from you, and we really do appreciate you. Um, we will also continue to play, pray for uh, Israel, yes, and we will pray for each and every one of you, for um, Lisa and Christina, those in the path of the storm. We pray that 
God will protect you and he will keep you and all of his children. And so now as we close out tonight, we just ask God's blessings upon you. We ask God's favor upon you. We ask that God send his Holy Spirit to dwell not only among us, but within us. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that as we depart this fellowship, this fellowship by way of technology, that you will remain within our hearts, remain within our spirits, that we will continue to open ourselves up to your will and that we will grow stronger spiritually every day. Um, the saying goes that if, as you learn better, you do better. So Lord, we are learning and we want to do better. Not only do we want to do better, we want to be better so that what you impart in us we can let that light shine so that others who are in darkness will come to your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.